Okay, Brian, you should be live. Go ahead and try right. talking. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So I'm the appetizer tonight. Everyone, thanks for coming. It's great to have you here on a Saturday. I know there's a lot of things you could be doing. But tonight we're going to talk about insulin resistance. I'm going to talk to you about, I'm an internal medicine, I'll give you all my stuff. I'm an internal medicine for the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, mostly doing adult medicine, dealing a lot with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, all these kind of things we see. Um, and I also have a podcast called CarbMD and another one, Life's Best Medicine, where we talk about all these other things. So basically, I have no financial interest. My pod, one of my podcasts is, is paid for by uh, Keto Mojo, who I'll talk about, and also Health Code, Ben Bickman's company. So basically, you don't have to know all this stuff. Don't worry. I'm just going to run through all these things. But you know, just talking about what are best practices, what do we do, um, what, how, in real life, not just, I, I hate to just talk about science without saying, how does this, what do I do when I go home? And so when we think about it, this is what we think about. Like when I see this, it makes me more nervous. If I see a really big person, it's distributing that fat everywhere. They're at a, better, they're at a lower risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes. So you can't just tell by looking at someone. But this guy concerns me because he has no muscle mass at all, and all of his weight is right there with the visceral fat. Uh, this is some, has anyone ever seen this before? Basically, you get some dark, it's called acanthosis nigricans, and it's just people will get dark spots around their neck, and this is something we see in insulin resistance. This is something that tips us off in the clinic, but also these are skin tags. So a lot of times we see skin tags, and we think, uh-oh, we better check the insulin because their insulin's probably gonna be high. Uh, huge correlation with diabetes. But the reality is, this study that they ended in 2018, and what they found was only 7% of people are metabolically healthy in the United States. So it's not just those things, we, we think about those things, but if you think about like 93% of us fall into all the factors that we'll talk about. So this is my simple way of explaining what insulin resistance, it gets so confusing. Uh, and so I try to simplify it as much as possible, so I won't quiz you on this stuff. Uh-oh, Chris, you know me. So let me switch you back. Okay. Okay, try that. Is that? I think we hear it. I have to yell. <laughs> so the train's like your liver. Wow, that's super loud. <laughs> How's that? All right. Oh, maybe up a little, maybe? Like uh, the three, the porridge? So you're going to hear about I promise. <laughs> How's that? Do we have it? I'm loud anyways, but the live stream can't hear, right? Do the handheld. Did you, did you plug it in? Did you try <laughs> plugging it and unplugging it? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay, so it's coming through the live stream just fine. Uh, I'll need to yeah. turn you off. Thanks. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Brian. All right. <laughs> I'm loud anyways. In my office, my office manager closes the door on me all the time. So... So you can think of your, the, the, your liver as a train as uh, basically a backup storage um, area for sugar, right? So the people are going to represent sugar, and the pushers are insulin. So the question is, how, many, how, many, how much sugar can our body hold in the bloodstream at one time? That's it. One teaspoon. If we have three, we die. <laughs> that's how amazing our body is. So that's what we carry, right? So if you think about this, our, our bloodstream can hold about one teaspoon, which is four grams. 
Our liver glycogen is our first backup battery, and that's 100 to 120 grams, which is about 20 to 20 to 30 teaspoons. And then our muscle is 400 grams, which is about 100 teaspoons. So having muscle mass is definitely beneficial. That's why you have friends who have a lot of muscle and they eat whatever they want and they don't gain weight and their sugars are normal. That's why. That's a huge deal. And we'll show that a little bit. And I just show, these are just some things that people think are healthy. And you can see how much sugar is in there. And that just fills up your entire train right away. So if we, you know, sodas and, and all the coffee drinks people had, they go, oh, I could eat a huge lunch because all I had was coffee for breakfast, but they had 11 teaspoons of sugar. They could fit one in their bloodstream. Plus, it's already full, right? So, so you imagine the train gets to the first stop, and everyone's social distancing because all night, what, what does the liver do? It allows the sugar to come out and go to your brain and heart and all the organs while you're sleeping because theoretically, we're sleeping for eight hours or so, depending on how stressed we are. And during that time, you emptied out the train to feed you know, all the other parts of your body that you need. So now you get to the next stop, and this is the noon train, and you have 110 people, and you only have 100 seats in that car. So what do you do? They all have to go to work, right? So you go, okay, everyone sit down, ten, the 10 strongest, you stand up in the aisle, you get all go to work. So everyone gets to work, everyone's happy. So you get to the next stop, and now you're in Tokyo. Right? And you've already filled up the aisle, so you shove as many people on. So people will go on as good as they can, but sooner or later, you have to hire these guys to shove people on that train because it's full, right? So these are the pushers, and that's insulin, right? So when we see the insulin going higher, that's an indication that your train is full. So if you can put 5,000 people on your train, then you're okay. It's overfilling the train that becomes the problem. So when people say carbs are bad, it just depends on how full your train is, right? You can think of it as a, if you're on a moving truck and you're, when you're, once you're, it's easy to put everything on there at first and then at the end you look and you have couches and all this stuff and you're like, oh, where am I going to put it? So then you have to hire a bunch of people to move everything around to try to shove it in. And that's what we get into. And then you can imagine when you're having this, pancakes and syrup and orange juice and all that for breakfast, your train is already full. You haven't even started your day yet. So then you hire more and more pushers. This is the, the scene we get into. Then we're shooting insulin, right? because you, you're hiring more and more pushers to try to put everyone on the train which is already full. So this guy does not want anyone else on his train, right? <laughs> and that's, and, but this is the problem. The ADA says, just shove more people on the train. Just shoot more insulin. We'll get more people on that. Well, you don't want more people. He did, he's going to be orange juice pretty soon himself. Whoa. So this yeah. is what happens. A lot, some of us here have been diagnosed with fatty liver disease. What that means is, the pusher said, look, we cannot put anyone else in the train. We're killing people now. Now we have to put them on top of the train. So that's fatty liver disease, which is extremely reversible, by the way, with lifestyle. But we have to get the people off the train, so we have to figure that part of it out. And so that's what we do. We shoot people with insulin. We go, look, your blood looks better. There's less sugar there. Yeah, but it's all on top of the train. That's a total disaster. And that's where we filter our blood. So how do we fill up the train quickly? This is the, sorry, the pointer doesn't work on the TV, but... You can see this is the American Diabetes Association recommended breakfast, and that's 21 teaspoons of sugar for breakfast. Total disaster waiting to happen, right? So where's all that sugar going? This is just you know, cereal, non-fat milk, a piece of brown toast with no butter, and some juice. Like, how long is that going to fill you up? And so how do we solve this problem, right? We could have more trains. So we could get really big and, and just keep getting, gaining weight. Some people can't do that. But some people I've seen are 500 pounds, but they're metabolically healthy. They haven't filled their train because they have a ton of fat storage to go to, right? Other people run out of storage units very quickly, especially in the Asian community and the, the Indian community. And so you could have fewer people waiting, which is meaning you're taking in less sugar. So if each stop you bring in a few people, you could stop a lot of times during that day and not fill up your train. Um, then you could do uh, time-restricted eating, you know, or you could be exercising, getting more people out of the liver, right? So then you could fill it back up again. Uh, the problem is hiring more pushers will not fix that problem. Once your train is full, you could hire all the, the pushers in the world, which is insulin. It's not going to fix that problem anymore. Question? Yes. Oh, and please feel free if you have a question or something's not clear. So when the train is that full, yes. you keep pushing people. It's just like our heart can't be breathing. I look, I see this example as being, I can't breathe, guy. Yeah, that's what it is, and your liver is the detox. Like yeah. when people drink too much, they get fatty liver disease, and they get into cirrhosis, and the number one cause of cirrhosis in the world is carbohydrate. 
no longer alcohol. Unfortunately, a lot of people are combining both. Obviously, that's a total disaster. So if we can think of our fat cells as balloons in a simplified thing, it's like, okay, at first, that fat cell is really sensitive to insulin because it's saying, okay, I could take, I have plenty of room. If you have tons of storage units, I, I could take more stuff at my storage unit. But what happens when your storage units all get full? So once the balloon is totally full, it says, I can't take anymore, right? This is too much for me. So just as a quick aside, there's some drugs that everyone's talking about right now that they're using to help with diabetes and, and obesity, where people are injecting these drugs. What these drugs do is instead, they just make you have more fat cells. So instead of having two really full fat cells that you can't break down, now you have 10. So as so long as you take the drug, you're okay. But now what happens when you go off it, you know, when they, you build it, they will come. <laughs> when you have more fat cells, when you stop doing that and you go back to your old ways, now you're in a total disaster situation. So the sugars get better at first because you, you, now you have a, more storage units to get it. So basically, you're just buying more storage units, right? So this is what our, our fat cells are saying. Look, I'm going to explode. I can't take anymore. So now what happens is they start leaking sugar back into the bloodstream. They start, start le leaking triglycerides back into the bloodstream, LDL cholesterol back into the bloodstream. Because if it's hiding inside the balloon, you don't see it. It's hidden from the bloodstream. So this is a huge point. And so if you haven't noticed, we're all complicated, you know. But here's the most complicated part from here up, right? We're dealing with addiction issues. We're dealing with stress. So many of us cope with life. This is Pavlov, so you know, like when I smell the food, I was like, oh, that sounds good, right? If I was out in the middle of the desert, I wouldn't be hungry right now. You know, people are stressed, depressed, anxious, and this really affects our walk and what we're doing. So this is what happens. It's like drinking out of a fire hose. That We throw all this information at the patient, they sit and look, it's like, oh, my goodness, I, I can't, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, but I, how do I make this happen in my life? So this is what happens. Everyone goes, oh, I just did it this way. Just go do it my way. Right? But all your friends have a different way to do it, so you sit there and you don't know what to do anymore. And so this is really what our journey looks like, right? We start out and we're all in, and then we go, oh, it's Easter. Oh, I'm going to have some Easter food, right? And then you go, oh, the in-laws are in town. Oh, I need a drink. I need some. And then you got Halloween candy. Then all these things happen in a row, right? Thanksgiving, Christmas holidays. So this is what they fail to factor in when they say, just eat less, you know, exercise more, because... They're not going through, you know, mice that they studied in the lab are not going through divorce, stress, getting fired from their job, having to deal with a nasty boss every day. So Ben Bickman, anyone know who Ben Bickman is? Hopefully, yes. So, so he's a professor at BYU, and he says, look, five things, right? And he influenced my life and career based on this because I was at a gym, five, six thirty in the morning, it's me and Ben. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's Ben Bickman. And he happened to know me because of the podcast. So I go, Ben, look, if I want to live a long life, what do I have to do? This is the take home. If you don't listen to anything else, listen to what Ben says. Manage your stress. At that time, I was working 18-hour days, right? Getting up at 4 in the morning, getting home at 9 at night, taking care of, you know, 30, 40 patients a day. And I go, Ben, okay, what's the second one? He goes, sleep. And I was like, oh, I'm driving 45 minutes to get to work and 45 minutes home. I have to drive in before traffic. I said, Ben, I don't like your rules so far because I'm 0 for 2. <laughs> And there's only five. And he says, that's why doctors die before everyone else, right? You're dealing with stress and you're helping everyone else but not yourself. Number three, avoid smoking and limit your alcohol intake, right? Next, exercise regularly like we were doing then and eat real food. Cut out the processed food, eat real food as much as possible, right? That's it. Those are the five things. There's other things that are out of your control, but this is what we can control. And his four pillars are saying, control your carbohydrates first. Number two, priority is protein. Make sure you get enough protein in your diet. Don't fear the fat. We're at keto chow, so I have to say that. But it's true. It's true. And, and fasting, right? Jason Fung, who's a good friend of mine, co-host of my podcast, he was talking about fasting, and I thought this guy was nuts until I started looking at it. And we could talk more about that in the question and answers. But um, keep your insulin as low as you can. Ben Bickman, who's one of the most humble guys I know, says, look, I don't care what anyone says. If you take fat cells from a chicken, a monkey, whatever, I've, I've dealt with, he, he does laboratory work. He says, you put fat cells in butter, bacon, you can put in sugar water, it will not grow in the absence of insulin. So insulin is a big deal for us trying to lose weight. So this is the endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria. These are really important for metabolic rate. These are really important for your energy. When you're fatigued and tired, because your mitochondria are sick. These are little tiny things right inside the cells, right? And sugar is toxic to all this. And especially the oversupply of energy. These are beta cells. 
This is what makes insulin. If we burn these guys out, we're in big trouble because now you're type 1 diabetic, right? Because if you're kicking out sugar all the time, if you're making more and more pushers to put, push that sugar into your cells, right? If your train is full, that's who burns out and that's where we get into trouble down the road. So these guys, this is bio-individuality, right? So unfortunately, Ken's not here. Ken Berry's the tall guy, right? That's Ben Bickman on the right. Me, the old guy who's got a lot, a lot of work still to do. And then Troy Collagen, who's my partner on the podcast, who's like 20 years younger than me. So bio-individuality, all that means is life isn't fair. Because <laughs> these guys can get away with more than I can. So I, I cannot eat what these guys are eating and think we can do it, the same thing, right? So these guys can laugh at those guys, though. This is Zach Bitter. He, he owns the world record 100 miles through the desert, 100 miles on his treadmill, 100 miles through the mountains. He's keto. Does he need to be keto? <laughs> Look at this guy. He's 145 pounds, all muscle. And he's a great guy, but he switched over because he was inflamed and in pain all the time. When he ran 100 miles, he couldn't get out of bed for five days. Oh. Now he runs 100 miles and gets up for a jog the next day. He's not inflamed. This is a huge take-home message. And this is Sean Baker, who's another friend of mine. He has all muscle. If he eats extra cookie, where's it going to go? To his muscle. Big deal, right? He could get away with way more than we can. So this is a big point. Exercise is useless, except if you care about these things, right? <laughs> when I first started keto, seriously, this was the, it really, honestly, people said, just eat right. You, you, exercise doesn't matter, but look at all these things. It lowers your all-cause mortality, lowers your cardiovascular risk, risk of heart attacks, strokes, all those things, lowers your risk of hypertension, diabetes, Lowers risk of uh, uh, high cholesterol, cancer, specifically bladder, uh, breast, colon, endometrial, esophageal, kidney, lung, stomach, pancreatic cancer. Uh, improves cognition. We worry about Alzheimer's as we get older. All the stuff we worry about, exercise helps. You worry about falling, you worry about, and I see it all the time, people can't get up anymore. And they need people to help them and they can't, you know, really take care of themselves at all. So this is a huge deal, it reduces anxiety, depression, helps with sleep, you know, all these things. You can kind of look, improves bone density for osteoporosis, all those things, sleep quality, all these things, quality of life. You can have more fun, go and enjoy life, but it's hard when it's a grind and you're in pain all the time and you have to drag a lot of extra weight with you, you know? So I, I'm just gonna fly through these very quickly. This was from a, a study they did in Colombia, and they looked at everyone who had a heart attack, right? And they said, okay, Let's compare them. So we're going to look, and the risk ratio, if it's a one, it means it was, made no difference at all. So they took everyone, like, say, half the, this half of the room had a heart attack. This, sorry that you're the heart attack group, but <laughs> this had a heart attack. This one didn't. And we say, what can we have looked at to predict this was coming? So when they looked at total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, there was no difference. So I can say, well, your LDL was 180. That's why you had a heart attack. High blood pressure doubles your risk of heart attack. Doubles it. High insulin? almost a 700% increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And I would wait, uh, maybe not in this room, but I will tell you in, Sa in San Diego, I, I meet probably one out of 100 patients who've had an insulin ever checked. So you say, well, why is that? If it's that important and the data is clear for a year of heart attacks, because I don't have a drug for that. It's lifestyle. It goes back to the stuff Ben Bickman's talking about. Statin drug, I could say, oh, let's put a statin on. I, I, I've had so many people already here say, my doctor wants to be on a statin, but they have never checked your insulin. <laughs> in my opinion, that's malpractice based on the data we have. Because the other thing is high insulin level makes you hold on to salt in your kidneys. Insulin gets rid of sugar, but it also holds on to salt. So when people are taking keto chow or other things, we have Redmond salt. Because when you drop your insulin level down, you start peeing out a lot of salt. So you have to take more salt. So being a doctor four years ago saying, yeah, you're going to eat more fat and you're going to eat more salt. The cardiologists weren't real happy about that. But the reality is people got better and you know, their blood pressure normals. Everything started getting better because the high insulin was the problem. So until we recognize that, this is another one. Basically, <laughs> this is crazy, but if you, it, the, the, the line in the front, I wish my pointer would work, but the line in the front shows an LDL cholesterol going from 100 to 220, right? The goal is less than 100 generally. But if you're in that back row in the back corner over here, here, I'll, I'll be the pointer. Back there, you're in bad shape. Here, bad shape. Like the, you, this is the worst row to be, that big, huge, tall one. That's having an, an HDL cholesterol of 25. A lot of doctors never even talk about HDL. HDL is by far the biggest marker. 
So the more metabolically healthier, the more empty our train is, we move up that row. So if your LDL is 220, but your HDL is over 85, it's this tiny corner right here of having a heart attack. If your, HDL, if your LDL was 100, right, there's not much of a difference in cardiac risk given your HDL. So the HDL is the biggest, bigger factor. And this just shows the higher your, your A1C, which is a three-month sugar average, the higher your risk of heart attack and stroke. So in women right now, this is, since you can't see it, this is an A1C of seven. And ADA says this is good. Would you rather be at seven or would you rather be at six? 300% decreased risk of cardiovascular disease. But they're saying, well, we're going to keep your A1C there and we're going to put you on a statin drug that will protect you. No, it's not. It's a disaster. So this is from the great Ben Bickman. When I saw this, I'm like, this is exactly what I'm seeing in clinic. So this yellow line is the sugar and the three-month sugar average, right? So the green line is your insulin level. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the A1C was a seven is what the ADA recommends. And that's when you can see it's at the highest, highest point. So as you come down in men and women, the farther your A1C comes lower. So if you're less than six, it drops dramatically. So it's a straight up line. So really, honestly, the, the A1C depends on what the insulin level is, right? So we could talk about maybe after because it may be a little complicated, but we generally like to keep in the five range. But being in four is not going to be that much difference because that, that flattens out. But as it goes higher, it becomes more dramatic. Because that sugar that we're seeing, really what the A1C is, is the sugar that's sticking to the red blood cells. And the more sugar that sticks to the red blood cells, it's also sticking to your tendons. It's also causing inflammation in your brain. It's causing all kinds of other problems, not just sticking to the red blood cells. That's floating around. So the green line is the pushers. So what happens is, we get more and more pushers over time. Between those two lines, that's called insulin resistance. So what we're doing is you're basically your train is full, and you keep adding more and more insulin on to, to, to fill up that train. So at some point, you've hired as many pushers as you can, and then they get tired of working all the time, and they go on strike. When they go on strike, right, you drop your, your, your insulin level down, sugar shoots straight up. So this is that insulin resistance. That's 10 years. We have 10 years to find it before it happens. So I catch people and their sugars are way up high. I mean, their insulin's high, but their three-month sugar average looks fine. So the doctor says, you're fine, we'll see you next year. They come back in a year, and the sugar's through the roof. It's a disaster. It doesn't just happen in one day. Diabetes is a progressive problem. So this is uh, very preventable. So insulin resistance, this is again from Ben Bickman. High insulin is causally related, not associated, right? Causally related, heart disease, cancer, liver, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovaries, erectile dysfunction in men or migraines, Arthritis, stroke, dementia, elevated body fat, diabetes, plus depression, anxiety, stress, insomnia, sleep apnea, name it. I mean, we'd have to have a thousand. But the problem is, doctors now have 10 minutes with a patient. Do you think they can address all those? They go, oh, you have high blood pressure? Oh, here's a pill. High cholesterol? Here's a pill. You have diabetes? Here's a pill, right? So that's a problem. And uh, this is my favorite tool right here continuous glucose monitor. They're the size of a penny now. It will tell my sugar 24-7, right? And, it will, and the Keto Mojo is what I use to check ketones. So this is one of my patients. He came to me. Uh, he weighed uh, 320 pounds. And his sugars, you can't see it very well, but it, it, his sugars were 260, 270 all the time. This is when he, the first day. And you can see the dates. They're October 1st, 2nd, 3rd. Here he is three weeks later. 80s. 80s. And we had to stop all of his meds over here. Because look, he started dropping down. That, this blip that you see right here was exercise. His body was releasing sugar. He was emptying his train to burn. He was exercising. And so we had to stop all of his meds, right? And uh, this is Jason Funk, because we did some intermittent fasting. And, and he really helped this guy to empty out his train. He, he made those balloons less full. Once they're less full, now you can get to them and work with them a little bit. Um, how much weight do you think he lost? In, that, in, that, in those three or four weeks? Four pounds. Four pounds. And I'll explain why, but don't forget that. Four pounds. Because this guy made me think a lot. In the same time, this guy's going from 320 to 316 pounds. His wife, in the same time, who started out at 158 pounds, lost 26 pounds. 
And this guy didn't cheat. I knew he wasn't cheating because I could see his sugars. So I'll, I'll show you why that is. This is, uh, what do you think that bump was? Yeah, it could have been. See, and that's a good point. It could have been exercise. That's why writing down what happened, because not all elevations are bad. So this was happy hour margarita time, right? And this was half a cupcake. Why? She got stressed at work. She passed by the cupcakes four times that day. And then someone was really rude to her, and she goes, that's it. I've had it. And she had half a cupcake. And then I met with her that afternoon. But look, you can see the little red. Her sugars went low after it went up. Insulin went up like crazy. Give her the sugar because of the panic situation. Boom, low. Next day, she was right back on track, right? That's great. Because a lot of people, the next day, they, it's going all over the place because they can't stop. Sushi versus steak, same patient, a few weeks apart. This is sushi. Healthy, everyone knows sushi's healthy, right? And here's a steak. Look at those sugars, totally different pattern, the same patient. So yeah, the better choice for them is steak. I don't care what the ADA tells you. Can sashimi spike my sugars? Sashimi, raw fish. It wasn't the sashimi, it was the sauce he used. He figured it out because he had to see Jim. He said, like, why is it 120? He knew it shouldn't be that. And he changed his sauce. And the next time he brought his own sauce, low carb, no problem. This one's oatmeal. This is a debate. This is a touchy subject for us because Gary Fetke, who's an orthopedic surgeon who's doing amputations, reverses his uh, metabolic health, health problems. And he started telling people, don't eat cereal, right? And he went to trial for three years. Hmm. Horrible. Because the head of his di the, the hospital, her husband happened to work for uh, Kellogg's. And they didn't like his message, apparently. But this is sure. So what's is better? How about you try eggs? That's eggs. <laughs> yeah, that's going to win every time. And you're not going to be hungry all the time. There's no red knot where it goes high and low and crazy, right? So fruit is fine, right? It's natural sugar. Banana, this guy says, oh, crap, I'm not doing that again, right? So he could see what happened. This guy was eating six bananas a day. He couldn't lose weight, <laughs> right? He goes, a natural. I put it in my shakes. I do whatever. So cherries, yeah, that'll spike you, but it's better than cherry pie, right? The processed stuff. Chinese food, disastrous, even without the rice, because generally they cook it in the same pot, and all the sugar comes out of the noodles and everything, and it's whatever you're eating. Even in vegetables, you'll see it. So... Thai food, same thing, high, and then you see the red low, so they're hungry again. Vietnamese pho, Vietnamese soup. This lady, four hours, elevated sugars. And it's even if you just eat the broth because the, it comes out of the noodles when you cook it. This is pozzoli. Sorry I'm ruining everyone's, uh, <laughs> every nationality. We all have stuff that's going to mess us up. What's the difference between the top and the bottom picture? One week apart, same patient. Wrapped in lettuce or the bun? Right? She's metabolic. Most of us aren't as dramatic, but for her, it was that dramatic. This is cauliflower crust pizza. It says keto. Mm. There you go. I've seen it over and over. This is why I like the CGM, because all these people say, I'm eating cauliflower crust pizza, but guess what? When they manufacture, they're using tapioca flour and all these different things. It's not low carb. You're better off eating regular pizza than that. Uh, and this is boring. This is what we like to see. This is my patient, typically. I'm like, OK, everything's good. We're on track. Everything's great, right? But it doesn't have to look like this. This is like, what did you do? My lady, this is, uh, if I have time at the end, I'll tell you about her. She's fantastic. But look at her sugar down there on the bottom. Was it oranges? Orange juice? Couldn't do this. But this was orange theory. That's a type of workout. She worked out really hard. This lady had spikes like this all the time. Guess what? She lost tons of weight, and she's in great shape. <laughs> because she was, these are workouts, right? Not because of what she's eating. So not that all, this is riding your bike. Will spike your sugar up? That's exercise. Your body's releasing it from the liver to burn, right? It's going the other way. And this is stress. This guy's boss jumped on a Zoom call, and he wasn't expecting it, and his sugars went up. But to make it even more dramatic, this is a nurse practitioner of mine. She reversed her diabetes. She just ran the New York Marathon. She's a stud, right? So here she is on Friday. Look at those sugars. You can see, you know, 100. She reversed her diabetes, but she's running 90 to 100. This is Friday. And I was stumped over the weekend because this is her on Saturday. What on earth, besides putting an IV of sugar in, can make your sugars be that crazy? Right? It's almost, if you eat cookies, you, it's hard to sustain it. They will go up and down like you saw all the other ones. But guess what? I said, well, what happened here? Right? I thought I busted her. But she said, yeah, I was giving talk, a talk to a bunch of doctors. And I was on a topic I wasn't really sure of. And I was stressing all day. I didn't eat that day. <laughs> Till 
after her talk, and look what her sugars did when she ate, right? Because she calmed her nerves in the stress, and you tell me this isn't a component? <laughs> it's insane. So this happened the same week. This is my other guy, CFO of a huge corporation, pretty chill, easygoing guy, but he's always, oh, I got to be here too. I got to be, he's always, at dinner, he'll get five texts and pages and stuff, right? So he's consistently busy. So this is the bottom one is what we typically see in this guy. He reverses diabetes, but his weight had plateaued for a while, but his sugars are running pretty good. So he's just dealing with life. So here he is. He says, guys, I'm taking 10 days off. I'm seeing my grandson for the first time. Don't bug me. If the place burns down, if we go bankrupt, I don't want to hear from you. You two are in charge. Figure it out. So here he is. The, on the left, on top, that's when he landed in New Mexico. And they got in late. And so they went to Taco Bell. <laughs> Look at that. Look at his sugars. It went to 235 from 94 to 235 with Taco Bell. Right? We go, I just have Taco Bell. It's fine. So he goes, okay. He goes, it wouldn't even, didn't even taste good. Then... The next day, he has some chips and salsa and tortilla. That's my kryptonite, by the way, right? Carne asada, chili rellano. And this one on the bottom, exercise, right? He goes, I got to get, I, I blew it yesterday. I'm going to exercise. We exercise. He went and worked out at the gym. And then he went to dinner and then had dessert that night because he's with family and they're just having fun. And then the next day, he says, holy, you know what? Uh, I'm not doing that again. Biscuits and gravy. Potatoes and one egg, that was that 256, right? And then they went to dinner that night because he was hungry all day after that. Then that, guess what he had over here? Eggs, bacon, avocado for breakfast. Do you see a spike there? Nope. And he wasn't hungry all day. So he didn't eat all day the rest of the day. His last day of, of his vacation. And so, they, he, so he was being good. He got a protein burger in a bowl. But then his family said, oh, it's your last night. These are the best sweet potato fries you'll ever taste, fried in canola oil or whatever, and the sugars to go up. So, so here's the, what are the net results that week? This guy's a disaster. 10 days, seeing his grandkid away from his stressful job, not lifting weights or anything like that. He went for walks, and, and his quote was, Brian, I was just wasting time. I was playing games. I was laughing with my wife. We were all telling stories about when we were kids, all that stuff when we, like we do when we have community like this. And he laughed more than usual. Net ga weight gain in 10 days? Minus 8.8 .8 pounds. Wow. And his scale is connected to me, so he cannot fudge this. He lost 8.8 .8 pounds that week. <laughs> Tell me stress doesn't have an effect. And so what about a monk? This is my patient who's a monk, who actually tried to poison me last week because he brought me kombucha. <laughs> and I was busy all day, and I didn't have time to eat. So I go, oh, I have that kombucha there. I'll have that, right? So... And I'll tell a little keto chow story on that too. So I had it and I was, and I was doing an interview and I was like, my sugar's 150. That's impossible. Like I run 80s all the time. 150, I'm like, oh, the monks messed me up with the kombucha. It's pure sugar, right? I mean, it's not pure. I mean, it's fermented off, but there was enough remaining where I noticed it. So the next day I go, let me, I'm curious now. I'm going to do keto chow first and then I'll do that like an hour later. It mitigated. I didn't go to 150. I went to like 112 instead of 150. So having fat in your system will make a difference, too. If you have stuff by itself, it's a disaster. So here he is, my monk, who's vegetarian, so he's hard to deal. I mean, he's a great guy, but he's a monk, right? So this day, I'm like, what happened to your sugars that day? And on the bottom there, he said, oh, we had these monks visiting that were really difficult, and we got into an argument. And I was like, you're a monk, and you got into an argument. So the rest of us can argue with people, too. But you can see the physiologic effect, right? I'm like, it's so funny. It's just funny. That's why I included it, because it's just funny to me that he's a monk. I'm like, are you guys supposed to be at Zen and peace? So I want to get back to my first guy that lost four pounds and reversed his diabetes. So unfortunately, I'm the bear, and my wife is like the lion. Like, she loses weight. Like, she doesn't even think about it. She, loses. she doesn't have to work out, and she loses weight. Like, we eat the same thing, and I weigh twice. Says, yeah, you know how it is, right? So how can that possibly be? And this is the guy who messed up my brain. So I was like, why would it be? Because what happened when he lost four pounds, he was so happy. I go, you lost four pounds, you're 316 pounds. And he goes, yeah, but uh, my clothes are falling off. My clothes are loose, my pants, I had to get a new belt. Four pounds? Uh, yeah, okay. So his wife goes, no, he's lost weight. I said, why do you know that? She said, when I used to hug him, I couldn't touch my fingers together, now I can grab my wrists, right? 6.5 inches off his waist when we measured him. With four pounds of weight loss, why? Because he's like a bear. You lose visceral fat, you put on muscle mass, right? And the lion, if you think about it this way, the bear has to burn that visceral fat. It's hard, and it's like the last resort, so you cram it in there. 
So you have to burn a lot of energy, right, to get to that visceral fat. His wife started with kindling because her visceral fat was really low already. So she just burned off the love handle and she lost weight like that because she didn't have to overcome all that, you know, burning all your oak before you can go to the twigs. But you can't start with the twigs. Why? Because your body is smart. It knows the, the, the oak is more dangerous. It has to burn that off first. That's the dangerous stuff. So subcutaneous fat is our unpopular friend that's protecting you because subcutaneous fat decreases your risk of heart attack. It, it's a, the hiding place. It's, it, all the stuff is going inside those balloons so you don't see it anymore, right? Negative correlation. So the more subcutaneous fat is, the less likely you have heart attacks and strokes. Decreases inflammation. So you go get a liposuction, it increases your risk of cardiovascular disease because you've taken out the storage units that are in the good neighborhood. It's unbelievable. When I read this, I'm like, how does no one talk about this? It's absolutely uh, astounding. So visceral adipose tissue causes more inflammation, increased risk of heart attack, strokes. Glucocorticoids, stress hormones, stress hormones, you're listening. Because stress is really important because it's going to make you store visceral fat. Right? Because it's telling you there's an emergency, things aren't good, you got to store energy for later, you're going to hibernate. So the bear, if you think about it, uh, if, if uh, Sean Baker was a bear, he wouldn't live through the winter. Because he has all muscle and no visceral fat. And I'll show you that. So uh, CRP, some of you will say their inflammatory markers are high. All that's coming from visceral fat. And the craziest thing is, I was reading this in the middle of um, COVID, and so visceral fat increases diabetes, lowers HDL, that important stuff raises triglycerides. That's why we're seeing what we see when people are eating a lot of sugar. But they'll say it's not fat, so it's okay to eat Slurpees all the time, right? So um, this top one's important because people say, oh, they're obese, that's why they're only obese individual with increased visceral fat show complications predictive of diabetes and heart attack. It's not just because people are overweight. That's the big one. So people are normal weight who are at major risk. And I'll show you that. I'll prove that to you with some scans. But uh, the other one, right three up from the bottom, TRIP-BR2, it's a protein made in visceral fat. It's a hormone. If you block that from happening, you don't die of COVID. They could not induce COVID deaths because the COVID deaths were inflammatory. So it was the visceral fat, the, the high sugars. I've talked to the world experts. All of them said the worst case scenario is high sugars. You have high sugars, your chance of death goes up dramatically. And again, that's that endoplasmic reticulum, that thing I was showing you in the mitochondria, get they get destroyed. So visceral fat, if you think about this way, right? In California, we don't see snow very often, so they wouldn't understand it, but I can do it in Utah. So <laughs> you can think of your visceral fat. Some people have a snowball, and some people have a snowman, right? So I have a snowman converter with my wife. So muscle mass is important because of this. Do you want to have a flamethrower, or do you want to have a match to burn your visceral fat? That's why the guy, when he was losing four pounds, he was putting on muscle at the same rate he was losing visceral fat. So he was getting smaller, but he was putting on muscle mass. So don't worry about the weight. We get so focused on that. Don't worry about it. It's about the health. So this guy, again, the same guy we had at the beginning, he has no muscle and he has a ton of snowman. It's going to take forever to melt that. You're in trouble. You better change what you're doing because it's going to be a disaster. Right? So this guy, Sean Baker, that everyone said was going to die of a heart attack, that's what he looks like. He has a flamethrower. How's he going to get fat? How's he going to get diabetes? It's almost impossible. He'd have to sit around and do nothing for two years, but eat cookies. Right? And this is a guy, basically, it, it just f f for the take home. And, and Chris, make sure I'm good on time. I don't want to run because I get excited, you know. All right. So <laughs> this is a guy, uh, um, you can see that all the pink he had in there. The yellow is the love handles on the bottom, and the, the pink's in the middle. Look at, he lost all the pink first before he started getting the love handles, right? This is 36 weeks apart, 35 weeks apart. So this is the point you can't tell a book by its cover. There's a big muscle guy over here, tons of muscle mass, hardly any visceral fat. The guy on the left, very skinny with no muscle mass, tons of visceral fat. So this guy dies of a heart attack and they go, he was healthy. We have no idea why he died. They never checked an insulin, I guarantee his insulin's through the roof, right? And his inflammatory markers through the roof, his triglycerides are through the roof, but he doesn't look fat because he cannot store fat out there, right? Those of us who can get fat, it's because our body allow, it's protecting us from ourselves. <laughs> That's what it's doing. It's not cursing us. So if we haven't figured out the elephant in the room is stress. It is the elephant in the room. And until we deal with that, COVID, tons of people gained weight. Tons of people gained weight. Most everyone gained weight, right? Because why? We're stressed, right? Like this is my patient who's not going to have success for a long time. 
She's stressed out. I can't, I can't do my meal plans. I got this. Oh, I got to meet. Hold on, doc. I got to text my kids. Wait, right? That stress, I can sense it. You can feel it. And I'm like, uh-oh, there's going to be a rough road. We got to fix that problem first. So these people, one of my guys, I'll show a picture at the end. He made me crazy because he didn't even care. He goes, oh, I lost six pounds. Oh, I lost four more. Oh, two more. Oh, God. He just kept losing weight. He didn't really care about the weight, but it just fell off of him because he didn't really care so much. So some of us are weighing ourselves six times a day and we're stressed like, oh, I, say, I, didn't, I didn't lose any weight today. What am I going to Relax. It's like getting pregnant, right? You got, we have to do it right now. Hurry, honey. Let's go. It's time. It's like, relax. You want on vacation and chill a little bit, right? Right? Uh, so this is another one I got in trouble from some of the low-carb people for discussing this. But I will tell you, this is the area of medicine that's coming up huge. It's an incredible. You know, we were talking about gastric bypass. Yes, your microbiome changes after gastric bypass. But, um, and some of these drugs that they're using for weight loss change the microbiome too, temporarily. But then it goes back to the old stuff if you go back to your old ways. So that's why, you know, Jason Fung and I were just talking. The gastric incidence of gastric bypass has dropped dramatically since 2010. Why? Because people are getting their weight back and they're getting into trouble and they're having more problems down the road. You know, I have some world experts in this room right now. So bi-directional. Your gut talks to your brain. Your brain talks to your gut. So if you're eating garbage food, you're always going to be hungry. And it, it has to do with this hyperpalatable foods. So these things that are so rewarding and you get chips. So I think a, a large bag of Lay's potato chips is like 2,400 calories, right? But you could sit there and eat that watching a game and not even think about it and then go out to dinner afterwards. But if you want 2,400 calories of ribeye steak, right? If you want keto chow for 2,400 calories, it's going to be hard to put that down, right? It's going to be hard to eat that much. So these short-chain fatty acids, all these microbes are breaking stuff down and saying, yeah, we have enough energy. Yeah, we have enough food. Don't worry. Everything's good. So this is a big part of it that we've missed out. It's not just about the insulin. Because when you look at obesity, diabetes, and binge eating disorder, was mom stressed when she was pregnant? Oh, the stress thing at that, right? Was mom stressed when she was pregnant? Increased risk of all these things. You don't have control over these things, right? Was mom eating processed food when she was pregnant with you? Yes, your risk factors go up. C-sections versus vaginal? Vaginal, guess what you get? Oxytocin and the gut, mom's gut microbiome. C-section is for convenience now. And we're seeing way more metabolic disease as a result. Breastfeeding versus bottle fed, huge difference. Why? Breastfeed, you get oxytocin, you get good stuff from mom, you get the, the microbiome that helps you. Uh, stressful home environment, trauma, we all know that. Uh, abuse, you know, sexual abuse, physical abuse. All those things increase our risk. Guess what? Independent antibiotic use. Why would that make you obese? Antibiotic kills off the gut microbiome, right? Kill off your microbiome. You're, I have people, one of my patients is a police officer. She's been thin her entire life. She got an infection. They put her on a huge dose of antibiotics. She gained 80 pounds in six months. Wow. Not changing her exercise, not changing her diet. Her gut microbiome got screwed up. So now we're working on it. Adult stress, poor sleep, worrying all the time, hating life, not going tubing. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because a lot of us, for me, really, when I was working a lot, I would think, man, I feel guilty. Yeah, some of us feel that way. It's like, oh, my. I have so much stuff to do, but oh, I just need to relax for a minute. Then you think, oh, I got to do, I have so much stuff to do, right? So there, it, it's self-help. Um, this is just basically showing if you eat healthy, you have a thick mucus layer protected. Some of you may have heard about uh, leaky gut syndrome, but this is a real thing. As a doc, for a doctor for 17 years, I thought this was absolute garbage. But when you look at the data, it's very clear. People who eat healthy on the, on the left side, their gut mucosa is good. And it's like they have a, a garden of flowers and roses and everything. Stress, or uh, people with food addiction and obesity, if you look at their gut, hardly any mucus to protect you, and you got all these bad bacteria. Those bad bacteria, when they break down, they release something called lipopolysaccharide. Lipopolysaccharide, they took these college students in Germany and they inject them with a, just a drop of this stuff. Within an hour, they're depressed, anxious, suicidal. They came in smelling roses, and now they're suicidal. It has a huge effect, so if you're, if you're eating terrible food all the time, we're being affected by that. You get brain inflammation, depression, anxiety, stress, insomnia, all these things happen. So this just shows how we try to intervene in medicine. We go, here's a pill for this. We're going to try to make you eat less. And, we're going to try, and, and so this is what we're doing. Instead of saying, let's try to fix the gut problem. And the, the, um, I like this one, too. It just talks about chronic stress symptom on the topic. So if we take a group of mice and they split into two groups, right? Group one. Since I gave you guys the heart attack last time, you could be in the happy mouse group. So they're, on the, they're at the beach, right? They're happy. They get all the cheese they want. They can listen to Bob Marley all day, 
right? They're taking it easy. The other group, they got angry cats that are wet, and they got lightning and thunderstorms. They can't sleep at night. They got mouse traps they have to go through. So they're stressed out. So what do they do? They bring them back together, and they go, oh, let's give them some dextran sulf uh, sulfate sodium, DSS. What does that do? It causes colitis. But guess what? None of the stressed ones, none of the happy ones got colitis. All of the stressed ones got colitis. They say, wow, that's weird. Let's look at their colon. So they look, there's no mucus on the ones on the right. Tons of mucus on the happy ones. The gut microbiome on the, on the right looks like weeds. That one looks like roses. They go, wow, that's crazy. So what they did is they took the microbiome out of the healthy one, they put it into a sick one, and it got healthy. They took a different sick one, and they put its microbiome into the healthy one, and it got sick. So then what they did is said, well, let's give the healthy ones antibiotics for a week. They give them antibiotics for a week, and they give them that medicine, and they all got colitis. So stress, because for me as a doc, we go, well, let's just be safe. We're going to put you on a course of antibiotics. How many people have heard that? <laughs> right? Let's just be safe. Well, is it safe? For an ear infection, you're probably going to clear on your own, right, if you eat healthy. This shows the effect of stress. Just like the bad food, stress does the same thing. It's the same thing on the, on the right. So if we're stressed, what do we do? We eat worse. We eat worse. <laughs> we make that cycle worse because you're stressed and tends to eat bad. And you're totally destroying your gut microbiome. And so... Uh, Basically, studies on Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, all the depression, autism. It, it's in, some of this, I, and if anyone wants to talk afterwards, I have stories that you would not believe talking to some of the experts in this area. So Chris Palmer, who, who wrote a book called Brain Energy, is talking about all these things. And it may not just be the insulin and the inflammation in the brain. It may have the gut, too. It, maybe it's a combination of these things. We don't live in a vacuum. So this is what we do. We get stressed. We get poor sleep, stress eat, gain weight. Some people are drinking, whatever. If you think about it, when you, get, when you cut yourself, you put alcohol in it. Why? To kill the bacteria. <laughs> so when we're drinking every day, we're killing the bacteria in our gut, which probably isn't a good thing. So we screw our microbiome <laughs> again, right? So these are, what, these are what screws up the microbiome, all these things I'm talking about, processed food, alcohol, artificial sweeteners, lack of, not all artificial sweeteners, I'll say, but it, it depends on how you're taking them. Um, the dose is the poison. And so there's Ben Bickman again. Oh, guess what? It comes back to all the stuff he said already. <laughs> We're all saying the same thing when you start seeing the whole picture, right? He knows his stuff, <laughs> right? So what can we do? Bone broth is helpful, you know? Uh, intermittent fasting, fasting rest of the gut. There's studies showing that if you fast for three days, I'm not just saying people just fast for three days, but if you're in a metabolic place to do that, that uh, you can replenish your entire gut microbiome, right? Sauerkraut, kimchi, all these kind of traditional foods. There's, there's a great book, by the way, uh, Dr. William Davis. It's called Super Gut, so I make my own yogurt. You put in the good bacteria, and you go, okay, I want more of that, right? And I just wanted, this is just one patient who's a dramatic example of what we're talking about. He has a glycogen storage disease, meaning he can't get sugar out of his liver very good. He can't empty his train to get it to his muscles very good. So his LDL was just barely high, and his doctor goes, you know, to be safe, we're going to put you on a statin drug. The guy almost drowned. He went in the water for three minutes snorkeling. Three minutes, an athlete almost died. And they pull him out, they lay him on the ground, he couldn't move for two hours. And so he goes to the specialist and they say, well, you can't get to your sugar stores very well, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you on sugar six times a day, and if you're going to exercise, drink soda or something so that you don't die. Your muscles are going to die if you don't get sugar in your muscles. So his, his A1C was 5.8, his insulin was 41.8, it was a disaster. And uh, triglycerides are 650, and the, the one in parentheses is what he's at now. His visceral fat was 5.3 liters. The bad stuff, he dropped it to three and a half. He was 254, now he's 210. So here was the problem they created for this guy. His insulin level was so high, insulin is telling you to store fat, not to take money out of the bank. So if we use it as a bank example, his muscles are saying, look, I'm working out, I need money. Insulin says, no, I'm giving you sugar all the time. I'm storing the money in the bank. So this is the problem he had. He couldn't use fat because insulin makes you not be able to get your fat stores when it's really high, as Ben, as ben Bickman will tell you. So what, how do we fix this problem? Here's what we did. I got yelled at a lot by him because I said, look, we got to cut the carbs. You cannot eat that much sugar. We have to get your insulin under control. But the poor guy, you could see how much red he had because whenever he wasn't eating sugar, he was dying because he could not get to his fat stores from his liver. He couldn't release. He couldn't empty the train at all to get to his muscles. So what does he have here? A donut. Because he couldn't stand it. He goes, I'm shaking, I'm nervous, I can't concentrate, I'm, sw I'm sweating, I'm miserable. So look at how much red and how much up and down and all that stuff is on there now. So we had to switch him. Like he, he can't run on fat because his insulin was too high. 
You can't run on sugar, right? Which would be the electricity, a uh, uh, Tesla, because that was the one. So what they did is this guy should have been more of a hybrid, but they made it so he couldn't run on any energy source, if that makes sense, because the insulin was so high, you can't get to your energy. So what do we do? Put him on a low carb diet. It had him eat more fat for a while. Lower his insulin down, that's him now. No lows, no high, happy as can be. He's eating his carne asada and his meat and he has energy for his body. But the reason I say this is some of us are 450 pounds if our insulin's high and you wanna eat salad during the day. It's not because you're weak, it's because you're starving. You can't get to your fat stores and your body's like, eat something. Go buy a McDonald's and get french fries and a Coke, right? Because that's gonna make you feel better. So it's a physiologic thing too, not just psychological. So now he's rollerblading with his kids, he's enjoying life, he's doing all this stuff. He couldn't do that before. He was totally sugar dependent. Now he's fat dependent, his ketones are coming up finally. So this guy, basically, I'm I, 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 out of sake of time. I don't know when I started, Chris, so you have to. So uh, basically this guy, he had it backwards from everyone else because what he was doing was gaining weight in the summertime and losing it in the wintertime. I go, wait a minute, all of us gain weight in the wintertime because we have Christmas and Thanksgiving and all this stuff. That doesn't make sense dramatic weight changes. So I said, what's the difference? When I met him, I said, what's the difference between, and he had lost a bunch of weight before, and then he started gaining it back. What's the difference? What are you doing? He said, well, in the summertime, I ride my bike all the time. In the winter, I can't ride my bike. I'm like, okay, calories in, calories out. You're burning more calories in the summer. You should be losing weight. He's gaining weight. And he goes, oh, I carb load all the time in the summer when I'm riding my bike so I don't get low energy. So I was like, oh, okay, so let's, not, let's fix that problem. So... What we did, that's him now. This big, huge spike in the top is him riding his bike up the biggest hill he had to go up. When he went up the biggest hill, his body took care of him and gave him the most sugar he had. And the, the reason I think to have a keto mojo or another thing to check the sugars is because of his continuous glucose monitor, even when it says 69, he was at 78. So his sugars were running exactly where they had to be the whole time. He rides his bike eight hours at a time, never gets low sugars but everyone else has a carb load, right? But he did have to carb load before when his insulin was really high because he was carb loading all the time. So if people have to carb load all the time, that's why they have to do it. And so this is the take home, I think, DHEA, uh, LDL cholesterol, all these things make our sex hormones. Oxytocin is critical. This is critical, right? So if everything's bad, everyone's being mean to you, you're gonna be like the bear. The bear's like, uh oh, I better store fat. And, but you know, your body says, you know, you're, you're so irresponsible. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you some cash to have on hand, a little bit, so you raise your blood sugar, but I'm gonna store all your money in the bank for you and you can't get to it, right? Cortisol, because you, bad times are coming, you gotta be ready. So that's telling you, slow the metabolism down, store fat, right? That's not a good combination for us. So, or you could do it this way. You could be like this lady, go, hey, you just got $100,000 extra in your bank. You can spend money now, right? So now you can have more testosterone and progesterone. If you want to get pregnant, this is a good time. And this is where fasting becomes controversial because women, five days before their period starts, if they're fasting, the body says, uh-oh, you're not getting any food. This isn't a good time to be pregnant. Let's make cortisol. Let's not go that way. Let's go this way, right? And uh, there's a great book called uh, Fast Like a Girl by Mindy Pels. She was the first one I heard talking about this. So I started researching and looking at the literature. She was 100% right. This is a problem. If you're stressed, intense, and worried all the time, you might as well eat a cookie and relax. You're gonna do better. Chronic stress is the killer. So, oxytocin is like exercise. Look, growth, resilience, healing, anti-inflammatory, it does the same things. That lipopolysaccharide that causes depression and anxiety over here on the right, it blocks that negative effect. It improves heart rate variability, right? Decreases risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke, lowers interleukin-6 tumor ne necrosis factors linked with cancer, right? Helps you stress, coping, anti-inflammatory, decrease anxiety, helps with sleep, all these things, oxytocin. So improves bone density, lean muscle mass, improves fat breakdown, improves your lipid panel. Appetite, helps your appetite. Like, no, Jason Fung and I were just talking about that. It's like, who's ever, uh, he's hilarious, by the way. He makes you laugh because he says stuff that's so obvious that you're like, how come I didn't think of that? But... You know, we were talking about, he said, do you ever see someone halfway through a massage going, you yeah, know, I'm starving, stop massaging me, I'm gonna go eat something, <laughs> right? No one's on a hike, we weren't, no one was saying, you know, tubing, no, we're gonna, let's stop, we're gonna eat something in the middle. Because you're having fun and you're distracted. So I have a lady, she lost 40 pounds, she's a psychiatrist, by taking up knitting. I'm like, how many calories is knitting burning? 
right? No, because she's not arguing with her husband. She's not stressed out. She's not thinking, what's in the fridge? I'm hungry. Just being focused and doing something, right? Finding something you enjoy, finding your peace is really critical. So oxytocin helps with beta cell. That's the one we want to protect. Remember earlier that makes our insulin, uh, decreases appetite, it helps convert. And this is one thing Ben Bickman also talked about where people didn't know how to take it, where, where it says increases energy expenditure, which is mitochondrial decoupling. So what oxytocin is saying is, like, hey, you got plenty of energy, you're good, you can waste energy. Give off some heat energy, right? You have tons of money in your bank, go buy a car, do what you want to do. So it's telling you everything's okay, but if you have too much cortisol, it's saying it's not okay. You cannot spend money. You can't spill any gas. You can't waste energy. You have to preserve everything. Hold on to every calorie. Let's shut that metabolism down so you have it for later. Oxytocin saying you have enough energy. You're good. You're exercising. Everything's good. Keep earning it. Go at a higher rate. So oxytocin deficiency, like there's a, this prater Willi syndrome. You eat all the time. You're agitated. They're stressed out. They attack everyone. They can't think. They have tons of fat inside their muscles, right? They lose their muscles, muscle mass, osteoporosis, not a good thing. So oxytocin is important, right? So maybe relaxing and binge eating. Menopause, we start dropping oxytocin levels too, especially when you're dealing with difficult people and all that. So which is better, hot-blooded or cold as ice, right? So what group is that? Please, someone tell me. Okay, foreigner, good, okay, good. Oh, I thought I was so old, I'm like, why not? So, uh, sauna, benefits, decreases cardiovascular risk, decreases risk of depression, and neurocognitive thing. So here's my problem. When I first started seeing all these things on stress, being bad, I have to tell my patient who's stressed out, uh, you're killing yourself with stress, by the way, right? I'm like, oh, now I'm more stressed because you're telling me I'm killing myself, <laughs> right? It's like telling someone who's paranoid, like, here, I'm going to give you a pill for your paranoia, and they're like, uh-uh, I don't trust you. So it's hard because we need an out. We need to figure that out. So what do you do if you're in a stressful job? Like for me, I left a very lucrative career and I said, I'm done. I'm going to do this. And it worked out okay for me. But it's, at some point, whatever it is is dragging you down. You got to look at that and figure that out. So it increases nitric oxide, which protects the heart attack. So you, you, put nit you, know, you put nitroglycerin under your tongue to help increase blood flow to your heart. That's exactly what this does. Helps with lung disease, helps with arthritis, headaches, immune function. That's Wim Hof. I thought this guy was nuts. You just breathe and they go in cold water. Guess what? Acute stress, everything goes high and then boom, everything drops down. And I can show you tracings on this stuff. Look, getting a massage. Is that hard to do? Go and look at the lake, you know, chill out. Pet dogs. Look, everyone goes, oh, see, that's actually toasting being released right now, <laughs> right? Read your Bible, your Quran. I don't care what you do, whatever you find pleasure in because. You could do Tai Chi and pick up girls like this guy's doing, <laughs> right? You could dress up like your character and everyone else thinks you're nut, but your friends think you're funny, you know? And so these things, don't do this, don't do this, too much, right? These guys get me worked up sometimes. Um, so this is me, 50, 50, we're, we're almost done, by the way, don't stress it. So this is me, so I did an experiment messing around with this stuff. Um, I was in Kansas City and had some barbecue sauce, so I was there, I admit it. Um, so I came back and my sugars were higher than usual. So this first one right there was the Tuesday morning I did a spin class, right? That's high intensity interval training. You go as fast as you can, as hard as you can. My sugar went to 180. Usually it's at like 70 or 80, you can see, or 90. 180, is that bad? No, my body say, look, you can't get your fat stores really good right now because you spiked your insulin over the weekend. So we're going to release extra sugar for you. And then I had health code, which is, right, very similar, a higher fat ketogenic diet, which I've never really done before and drop my sugars down. So basically what I started was doing an alternate day fasting. So I would fast for like 44 hours, 48 hours, and then I would eat two meals a day instead of doing one meal a day, which didn't work for me. So I want you to see down here this day, I had a, a podcast interview. I didn't work out that morning. Look at my sugars were flat all day, right? It doesn't spike like that one. My ketones starting was 0.4 that first day. Over here at the end part of my fast was about 1.4. And I don't chase the ketones, but it's, I just want you to see what I'm saying here. So that one on top, and I'm going to lay them next to each other so you can see. That was the same exact class with the same instructor with the same music. My, my sugar went to like 120 instead of 180. That's a 60-point difference. That's pretty dramatic. The spike after that was a, I went in the sauna, and it, it, and it, can, it can confuse the continuous glucose mo uh, monitor. 
So that's what you see down there. But you can see my ketones just kept going up, up to 2.5, which is unusual for me. I usually run uh, lower, like 0.8, 1.2 after your keto for a long time. You don't get as high of ketones because you're burning those a lot. So that's spin class Tuesday. That first one went to 180. You can see the second one on uh, Thursday, which is two days later. The next Tuesday, hardly anything. But I did a little bit of weights before that. And then look at that Thursday. Hardly, you can't even tell. Same exercise, same everything. Everything's the same. So what changed? Well, you can see my ketones changed, right? 0.5 to 1.2 to 3.1 to 2.7. But this is zone two right here I did before. And I'm going to show you closer. Zone two is 180 minus your age. Looking, you're trying to keep your heart rate steady. The thought was always, there's a, a kink that get, got thrown into this by Professor Noakes, saying if you're running at that, you're pure fat burning. So if you want to lose fat, you go to a slower rate for a longer period of time. Which is 100% true, but there's benefit to it still. And that this, to prove the point with my other guy, this is, both of these are fasting bike rides one week apart. The first one, big hill at the beginning, like Joseph pointed out, fasted. Where did I need to carb load that? I rode for two and a half hours, fasted. There's no need for carbs anywhere in there. My body said, I'll release fat for you to burn. You don't need to release a bunch of sugar, except on that big hill, it's overshotted a bit. And over here, it hardly did anything really, right? And that big dip down, this is why we, we should double check because that was an artifact from jumping into a cold pool doing this Wim Hof crazy stuff. So, uh, but I just wanted you to see that's zone two over here on the left, zone two, which is an hour of, of low level exercise, followed by HIT training, spin class. You hardly see any spike on that. Because my theory is that you're priming the pump. Your body's used to burning fat. You're already giving me fat. You're releasing it. Why do I need to panic and release a bunch of sugar to burn? I don't really have to. I'll run on what you're giving me, right? That's the idea with keto challenge, some of these things. Like, if you're giving me fat to burn, why do I need to switch back to sugar? Also, that, that, this, this one on the right is HIIT training the same day. I did 15 minutes of all, HIIT training is all out sprinting to get your heart rate up to like 170, and then you, drop, you walk slow, and then you get down to 130. So you're going up and up. But you can see how dramatic it was at the very beginning. But I, I did an hour of zone two training in between. At the end, I did... Uh, Sprint, the same exact workout, again. Look at it, it's hardly any different. I mean, it's a huge difference in how the sugars responded. Because my th thinking is that my body didn't really care about the sugar anymore because it was caring about burning fat. It was already in that fat burning mode, so it primed the pump a bit for that exercise. So, you know, there's different ways of thinking about it, but either way, they're both good to do exercise. And so, uh, this is the importance of community, right? Even if they're knuckleheads. <laughs> Right? Like these guys, uh, you know, these are my patients on that. If anyone saw the movie Fat Fiction, hopefully. If you haven't watched it, I'm in it. But those are my patients who reverse their diabetes, right? Um, but all of them, the big thing was every single one of them said their mood, depression, anxiety got better on a low carb diet, even more so than getting the sugars right. That's us. This one, I just have to close on this because this is really important to me. This, these are ladies in Vacaville, California. They all had obesity, diabetes metabolic disease, they were pretty sick, and their boss loved them and said, hey, I need help. Can you remotely meet with these women? So these ladies started, and they were a disaster. We got their, their break room squared away. We talked to them about nutrition. I talked to them about exercise. So anyways, this is one of our last meetings, and they go, look, doctor, look at what they have. Cookies and, right? I'm like, oh, my gosh. And they go, we didn't have any. We didn't have one. This is 5 o'clock at night. Those were sitting there all day. I go, there's a couple missing there. And they said, those are the other people who aren't doing it with us, right? But, and I said, well, how do I know? I was teasing them. They said, well, you can see our CGM and you'll know, right? But they give up their tortillas and their rice, and it's, it's, it's unbelievable what they've accomplished. Um, just simply just understanding. So this is my guy who I told you he, he didn't care 16 weeks apart. Ridiculous. I'm like, I, can, I don't even like you. <laughs> right? He didn't even hardly work out. Now I got him finally working out and he's putting on some muscle. But, but look at that. 16 weeks apart. This is my other lady who's a teacher. Look at the, what she's accomplished. She was like, you tell me what to do and I, I'm doing it. You tell me and I'm, and she was all in and that's her now. So I was like, she just gave me that on Instagram. Super awesome. So thank you. Thank you. And I think we're going to answer questions after. Okay, so hold on a second. We're going to switch out microphones for the Two Crazy Ketos, and we'll be right back.
your bathroom break, right? Because I have like four pairs of pants on right now. So that's not something that you wait until the end and decide like, oh, I think I'm just going to run to the bathroom because we're in Florida. I can just like take off shorts and on. No, this is a planned event. Joe did not plan right. Okay, so he's got to put on his three pairs of pants before we can come back. Hopefully he will zip up because we've already had somebody where it was like, oh, can we get a picture? Sure, but we'll put the zipper up first, you know. Just for, okay, there we go. And we're all, we're all good. Oh, we're good. Okay. Thanks. Are y'all having fun? Yeah. Did you? You're hating it. Food and deliciousness and community. It's for the birds. Did you enjoy Dr. Lenska's presentation. Yes. Amazing, right? You know what my takeaway was? A lot of those things, did it seem reasonable what he was saying? Reasonable, right? Doable, right? And I was thinking to myself, maybe, just maybe, we're overthinking this a little bit, a little bit, right? Like sometimes, maybe, just maybe. I have never been accused of underthinking something. Have you ever? Making a mountain out of a molehill? Fantastic. Anybody make a molehill out of a mountain? No, no, no. So maybe we're overthinking this, right? So we're just going to have some fun. Go on that side so you don't trip. I'll probably trip anyway. I don't really need any help tripping. Well, hi. So I'm going to start out with, we had no idea what Dr. Lenskis was going to talk no, about. No, we did not. So, But it's funny because as we're watching it, guys always ask them, he puts things on the same page. And so there's a lot of things that are going to, kind of correlate and I'm excited about that. Yeah. But for those of you who don't know who we are, I'm Joe. And I'm Rachel. And we're two crazy ketos. And we love keto. If you've never seen our channel, we're crazy for keto. That's yeah. why that's our name. It's in the name. Um, I've been keto for over six years now. I've lost and maintained over a hundred pounds. But here's the thing about keto. We love it. And we have a love affair with keto, but some people kind of go off and on. And so today we want to talk about how to stay in love with keto. And I thought that this is perfect, right? Because it's February and we're talking about, oh my gosh, I just want to say hi. Just want to hug Marie. Oh my gosh. I love Marie and I love keto. And yeah, and staying in love, that is challenging, right? I mean, this hot bald man over here, love him. But we have to stay in love. Right, and that is a work in progress, right, honey? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, so in case you don't know who, where we, you can find us. We are all over the internet. We're on YouTube. We have over five videos a week, and uh, we have a website, twocrazyketos.com. You can find us on Mighty Networks. That's where we spend a lot of our time because we are all about community, and then on all the other social media aspects. But here's the thing about keto. Before keto. We dated a lot of diets. Yeah, I mean, we say all the time, we're not doctors, and we're not nurses, and we're not health professionals. But I could say we are relationship expert when it comes to dieting, because we've done it all. For me, I mean, there's more than this list, but like, I mean, we've only got one night, right? Okay, so Weight Watchers, Joey says, I never did Weight Watchers. Well, I did several rounds of Weight Watchers. I paid for that. Anybody else pay for that lifetime membership to Weight Watchers, right? South Beach Diet, I did vegetarian a little bit. I did veganism. I did the Slim Fast Diet, deal a meal. How many out there did deal a meal? Were you moved Sweating the Sweating to the oldies? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I will still do that because, like, I love that music, right? And also Richard Simmons and those shorts. I got Joe some of those shorts. He will not wear them. Maybe you got right in. Email him, okay? Severe calorie restriction. That's probably what I'm best known for because of the fact that I had worked myself down to 500 calories a day for two slap years before we started keto. And, and she gained weight. I'm so extra at that. Who gets to gain weight, like, barely eating? Okay. All right. Awesome. I'm not alone. I love that. But you had your own, like, dating of diets. I did everything. And, you know, I w we were thinking about this earlier. Even before dieting, I was concentrated on weight loss. When I was in junior high and high school, I lived on Long Island. I went to Boy Scout camp every summer in upstate New York in Livingston Manor. And I looked forward to Boy Scout camp, not because I loved Boy Scouts and I was an Eagle Scout and all that stuff. And yeah, I like to shoot guns and 
archery and go on the boats and stuff. But what I looked forward to was the fact that our campground was always at the bottom of the mountain and the dining hall was at the top of the mountain. And I went for six weeks. So every summer I came home down 25 pounds. That was why I liked Boy Scout camp because I knew at the age of 13, I was gonna come home and for at least a month of school, nobody was gonna make fun of me because I was fat. Of course, by the end of the year, I gained it all and it became a cycle. But by the time I got into college, I had gotten up to ridiculous weights and that was where I got my first membership and I joined Nutrisystem. And this was when they had stores and you went in and you publicly weighed in front of everybody. That's so fun, And right? they gave you packaged Super foods. Fun. I have a lifetime, still to this day, a lifetime membership for Jenny Craig. Um, we did the cabbage soup diet. I did Atkins. I did the healthy choice lean cuisine. We invented a diet called the Progresso Soup Diet because we were couponers. And we would find these buy one, get one free coupons for Progresso Soup, and then they would go buy one, get free at the grocery store. So we were getting free cans of soup. So one time for six months, we did nothing but eat canned soup. It didn't work. It didn't work. And then, of course, I tried eat less, move more. Just, you know what? Calories in, calories out. Make sure you restrict your calories. And then, all the co and of course, make sure you're going, working out, doing two hours on a treadmill, which didn't work. So because we had dated so many diets, it stands to reason we've also broke up with a lot of diets, OK? We have broke up with a ton of diets. I mean, we have each lost and maintained more than 100 pounds we of weight We say loss. that we're expert. We're not experts. We are experts at gaining weight. Yes. And I'm, losing weight. I'm amazing. I dare anybody to gain weight at the rate I can gain weight, OK? So we broke up with a lot of diets. And um, it's, it's hurtful. It, it's painful to do that and to do it over and over again for decades. A little thing about this picture here. This picture here, I have no idea what my weight is. Uh, this was about a month before I started keto. Uh, about five months before that, I got on a scale. I weighed 285 pounds. I was an extra large shirt, a tight extra large, but it's an extra large shirt of 40 pants. And I never wanted to see 300, so I didn't get back on a scale after that. This picture, I'm wearing a triple extra large shirt and a 44, 46 pants. Don't know I, what I weighed. Pretty sure it was over 300. This is really an exciting thing because we don't have a lot of pictures of Rachel. That's at also this size. a thin Rachel. That is very thin Rachel. Um, uh, the only reason why this picture is here is because that gentleman right over here, Mickey Mouse, got me in that picture because I love me some Mickey Mouse. And so I was willing to take a picture. But yes, I had pretty much launched myself into a 22. By the time I uh, you know, had really tapped out, I didn't want to get on the scale either, but it was like you had to just have a running start to get into your outfit. Like, am I the only person that's actually used a piece of hardware, like an actual tool to zip the zipper on your pants? Am I alone in that? Somebody else? Okay, I've actually used something to zip it, yeah. So we have broke up with a lot of diets, but it is not our fault, I mean, I know that that sounds like I'm passing the blame here, but some relationships, there's just no way that it's going to work. We gave it our best effort. We though. tried to make the diets work, right? You ever been in a relationship? You don't really want to be in it, but I'm going to make it work because I've made this commitment. We did that with diets. I mean, and I look at some of the things we did, like, again, I, I'm an expert at losing weight and I'm an expert at gaining weight. And so I always knew in the back of my mind that, hey, I lost the weight. So even if I gain it back, I've, I've always got cabbage. I can always go back to eating nothing but cabbage and drop the weight. Now, I'll probably gain it back. But I knew that in the back of my mind, even if I gain it back, I figured out how to lose it. Yeah. But what I never could figure out is how to keep it off. Right. How to, how to maintain. And part of the reason why there was a problem with each and every one of the diets that we had tried before is they looked good on paper, okay? They look good. When you would watch the infomercial on deal -A meal it seemed so straightforward, right? Like I would read things about Slim Fast. You know, I'd read the back of the can and I'm like, this is going to work. This looks really good on paper. The problem is none of the diets that we tried were built for a long-term relationship. They were only built for a summer fling. There was no way that I was going to be able to eat cabbage soup 
the rest of your life. What do you do? What am I going to do? Take the vat to Christmas? Like, am I going to my work party with like a lean cuisine meal? And I'm, and I'm going to be like, hey guys, like here we are at the potluck and I've got my slim fast shape. Like these things, it's not built for a long-term relationship. So how many people watched the Super Bowl last week? Nobody? A few people watched the Super Bowl? <laughs> Here's the thing about football. Now, I don't watch professional football anymore, but I am a high school football official. And kids in high school get scouted for colleges, and then the pro teams scout the college kids. And every year they have a draft, hopefully to pick up the best possible player. And many times, these players look really good on paper. But then they get on the team and they stink. And within the first year, of course, sometimes they sign for millions and hundreds of millions of dollars and then they don't pan out. But what's happening is the teams are gambling on this player. He may work and he may not work. When we go into all of these different diets, we're basically gambling. Will it work before we rage quit? Right, exactly. Like, will my starving, will I be like able to sustain it starving versus I am just going to throw this can of Slim Fast like right out the window. Another problem with it, oh, if you want to go back, babe, another problem with it is they couldn't be scaled to our family's needs. So we have three boys we were raising. If, you know, we would have to take turns. Who is paying for Nutrisystem? Who is going to be on Jenny Craig? Because these things can be very costly. And so we weren't able to both be on things at the same time. A lot of times these diets will get you in with like a low rate to start. The first month, it's like a drug dealer, right? The first month, the first hit of Nutrisystem is very inexpensive. But to maintain it, it's going to cost you a lot of money. And of course, all of them were very restrictive, right? Yeah. But keto is different. And I know that a lot of you go, wait a second, keto's restrictive. You're not allowed to have carbs and sugar and pasta and grains. And, and any of that stuff. But we're gonna go over some things here and because here's what I'm gonna tell you. Keto is the most least restrictive eating lifestyle you will ever have in your life. And we're yeah. gonna show you why in a bit. And I think it's important for us, whenever you're trying to look at your relationship, every now and then you've gotta weigh the pros and cons. That, that's the old school way. I don't know if like when you were like in middle school and you had kind of a heartthrob or you were thinking like shit, you know, he, he sent you that letter or she sent you that letter that's like check yes or no. Like do you want to go out? you want to be my girlfriend? You know, which pretty much means like be sitting in the same vicinity as me. Um, <laughs> check yes or no. I'm weighing the pros and the cons. And so there's going to be days even on keto when you got to remind yourself why did I come to this diet? Why do I love this lifestyle, okay? So the first thing that I think is very important for us to remind ourselves of is keto has no commitment issues, okay? Keto is not a booty call, all right? You can actually, Rachel. I'm sorry. You can, you can date keto in the open, all right? You don't have to be embarrassed. When you have food that's like meat and vegetables, I can bring that to the company picnic. I can take that to Christmas. Not every person in your family may be on board with it, but like you can make it work. You think it's hard to go to Christmas and be like, we're only eating, you know, bacon and broccoli. Try coming to Christmas with a slim fast shake. Put that down and see if grandma's like okay with that, right? Like talk about offensive. So there's no commitment issues. I can do keto anywhere. One of the other pros, a huge pro to me is the mental wellness that is connected to keto. I was on medication for depression anxiety, social anxiety for decades. I tried to attempt suicide two times. I thought about suicide many times. Since being on keto, I am on no medication, no more doctors, no more going through that, no more out of control and thoughts. she's always depressed. Clearly, right? <laughs> Social anxiety. I'm not able to be around people. I'm not uh, able to be in crowds, not being able to talk to people, even one on one. I think keto is working. I think keto is working in this area. For me, one of the reasons keto works, anti inflammatory. Some of you may know my story. When I was 20 years old, I had a severe car accident. I spent two years on crutches, told I was never going to walk again. Up until I found keto, I was taking Arthrotec, which is an arthritis medication, and Vicodin every single day for 24 years. 
It's amazing that I didn't get addicted to the painkillers. All of a sudden, I, like many people, start keto only to lose weight. It was a weight loss bed. Six months in, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm not taking any of my medications anymore. When I started keto, my doctor said, listen, you're done. No more officiating after this season. You need a replacement. You're going to have to replace your ankle. The only problem is that is a one-year recovery. You won't be able to be on your feet for a year. I was a landscaper <laughs> and a sports official. That is going to be difficult. I didn't know what I was going to do. I came home and I realized I haven't taken any medication. That's why this relationship works for me. It's not about weight loss anymore. It's about all of the other health issues that I'm experiencing. And the same thing with reverse disease. This has been a very important thing for our family. I lost my father to a Widowmaker heart attack um, and forced my mother into keto, basically, because statistics show that if a couple's been together for about 50 years, you lose one, you lose the other. I wasn't willing to lose my mother. She's the only person I've ever fought keto about. Some people come to me and we talk about keto and they're like, it's not for me. I don't try to force it. I did force it on that woman. Thankfully, <laughs> reverse disease. So she is no longer a type two diabetic. She was for more than 20 years. No more heart medication, no more need for any stints. Um, it's, it's really spoken into disease for our family. The other thing that I, I really love about keto is it is doable at home, at work, on vacation, I mean, because just anywhere. Because it's the least restrictive diet you're ever going to eat. Why? Let's look at some of the diets we've tried. Calories in, calories out. What are we restricting? Everything, right? <laughs> Joy. You can't Joy. eat food. Let's eat how I grew up, low fat, right? You can't have anything delicious because you can't have fat. No bacon, no burgers, uh, skim milk that was powdered, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, plant-based whole food. Well, if you know anything about plant-based whole food, no added fat unless there's fat in the vegetables and absolutely no meat. So we're being restricted there. So, okay, keto. We can have pasta, sugar, grains, carbohydrates. Which of the other diets has alternatives that allow you to fill in the things that you're missing? Is there anything, if you're eating a low-fat diet, that's going to replace the fat and be like, hey, you don't miss fat? Is there anything that's going to say you can eat more food? I look at keto, and you come in here and like, okay, maybe it's not the greatest thing in the world, but every once in a while, I love ice cream. If I'm eating a low-fat diet, I can't eat ice cream. But if I'm eating keto, I can get keto chow and not only have ice cream, but I can eat it for breakfast and it's good for me. Because he's what an adult. What other diet allows that? <laughs> right. Chicken nuggets is one of my favorite things. Yes, I'm 52 year old and I want to eat like a 10 year old. But you can't eat chicken nuggets on keto, right? Because they're breaded. Except for we came up with carnivore chicken nuggets combining pork rinds, cream cheese, and then putting some Parmesan cheese, and I challenge you to give them to somebody who is not keto and have them tell you, this is disgusting because there's no breadcrumbs on it. Right. So well, there's plenty of options. It's delicious. It's budget friendly. Uh-uh, wait a second. We're talking about ribeye and bacon. That's not budget friendly. Well, here's the thing. Because we're not going to the doctor and we're not buying, getting a whole bunch of medicine, and you're not having to have the anti-inflammatory medicine, which costs us like $175 a month. We, we move the, our budget over here into our ribeye budget. So before keto, Rachel and I every day went to Starbucks and got a $6 Frappuccino each. I, so I have a lot of stress, okay? Anybody ever have Starbucks before? Be honest, okay? <laughs> We saw the coffee drink before. It's got more sugar than Coke in it. So there's pretty much no $6 drink in Starbucks that you can have on keto. So if you just went to Starbucks and got black coffee and spent half as much, so that's $3 a piece. Well, the other $3, that's a pound of ground beef. Well, I was just thinking while we were talking about like all the, you know, the drinks and delicious drinks, we're sitting in a place like, is there like any flavor of keto chow that isn't like flipping amazing, right? Also under $6. Uh, oh, okay, peach. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. And 
And it is great for every family member. Now, Keto Chow cannot say that it's okay for kids. We can. But I can, <laughs> because I don't work for Keto Chow. And so I've given drop biscuits made with Keto Chow to my entire family, including niece, you know, nephews. I don't have a niece, but like, I've, maybe we're gonna have one. We have a grandbaby. Yeah, we have a grandbaby. Guess what? She's gonna be getting Keto Chow ice cream. I can guarantee that, and pancakes and all of those things. So. It is but great. But we don't even have to talk about keto. Yeah, so let's no. look at the rest hey. of the food on keto. Great for the family. There is nothing you're going to eat on keto that isn't good for everybody else in your family, even if they're not keto. Yeah. Everybody in your family can eat steak and bacon and eggs. Eggs is one of the healthiest things you're going to ever put in your body. So even if they're not keto, which I don't know why they're not, but even if they're not, you can give them the same thing you're having and then say, hey, you want rice? Go over there and make it yourself. Yeah. Maybe not to a toddler. Uh, Don't tell them. Well, the toddler <laughs> shouldn't have a choice, so yeah, okay. that's a side okay. okay, all right. Okay. So we've established that it is a good match. It is a good match for everybody. But like in any relationship, you still have to work at it. Really? I love this man, okay? But we still have to work at it. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. <laughs> it's not that easy, okay? He's a very big personality, okay? Very big personality. All right. So you got to work at it, and there are going to be some days where things seem bumpy. And on those days when you're like, I don't really have the motivation to stay keto, we need to have something to remember. We need to have something to anchor to. And I'm going to ask all y'all. We need some audience participation. Yeah, we need some audience participation. We're going to kick it old school, because if you're in middle school, you're in high school, there's really only one way to document your love. How did we document our love in the 60s, 70s, How 80s, did you 90s? convey, how Who did remembers? you communicate Anybody have a hint? No? no. How did Put it in your car. No mixtape, mix tape, right? Boy. You know what? Please when we're don't losing go, our girl. love. Right, the mixtape said it all. Well, and maybe. Yep. We need to update our mixtape. You might need to update your mixtape. You got to check that mixtape, okay? So we're going to talk about some songs on that might be right now on your mixtape. You know, it was so funny. I don't know if maybe I, I, I'm afraid to even look at Joe when I say this, but anybody uh, like fall in love with somebody, make them a mixtape, and then you guys broke up, and then you like fell in love with somebody else, and you get a give them a mixtape, right? <laughs> Some of the songs from the other mixtape made it onto this mixtape. Cause I mean, it's just the only way to convey it, right? Like right. there's only so many songs. But today I want you to look at your mixtape. Maybe is there a song you need to take off of that mixtape? Now this isn't gonna speak to everybody. Not everybody's song, like is it, we're gonna show here, okay? So, but maybe one, maybe one, let's see. Ready? Right. Yeah. So the first song we might want to take off our mixtape, I Want You to Want Me. Now this is, a, okay, it, can anybody sing a little bit of that? I want you to want me. I need you to need me. I love you to love me. 1977, I right? you to hate me. Right? Cheap trick. It is a cheap trick because this song is to carbs. This is a carb song. This is a carb song, right? Because isn't that what carb is say, carbs are saying? Have you ever, I mean, bacon, you smell bacon and you're like, it's crying out to me, okay? Yep. But if it's a sugary thing, dude, that's what those carbs are saying, right? They're saying, you need me. I, I want you to want me. I'm begging you to beg me. And carbs. It's my birthday. It's my anniversary. Carbs, come on. It's, it's, it's my We're neighbors. We're gonna be a fling today. And cats coming home from the hospital day. We gotta celebrate it with carbs. And carbs is kind of like the Fonzie, like kind of, you know, the cool guy with a motorcycle, and like nobody can reach him, but he's got a heart of gold. And like I'm gonna be the one that turns him right. So I'm gonna mess around with him because like I have a feeling that for me. For me, he'll be different. I mean, maybe Ron and can like mess with carbs, but like for me, it's gonna work. We need to stop dating the carbs. The carbs need to stop being our little fling over on the side, Yeah. right? It's time to break up with the carbs. Our good friend Mary T up there in Canada says it all the time, right? What did she say? Keto 
every day. Want to be successful? Keto every day. So for somebody, maybe you're watching online, I see you, I see you in that little lens up there. Maybe that's the song we got to take off. Stop okay. messing around with them. Ready for the next song? Yes, I am. Okay, let's see how many people can sing this one. Every breath you take and every move you make, every take, I don't know. We just made it up, right? Like at that point, there's so many songs that like that, that like if I sang it, it's like that, it's not it at all. Like they, your, your kids remind you, right? Like those are not the words. Okay, so do you really want um, like somebody trying to date your child singing that song to them? It is not a song of love, right? It is a song of obsession. And so today, this song may need to come off of somebody's mixtape. We're going to upset some people. I know. I can't even look. But it, here it is. Is there something in keto that you're obsessed with right now? Yeah. Is it tracking? Is there something oh. that's affecting your journey in a negative way? Now, we're going to start off with, we are not against tracking. No, we're not. I think that, there, that tracking and counting things can play, have a good place in your keto journey, especially at the beginning. Yes. But if we are getting to the point where we are so obsessed that we haven't eaten for 48 hours and our stomach is saying, dude, you gotta eat right now. And you look at your watch and you say, wait a second, according to my watch, I've gotta wait 26 minutes and 36 seconds before I'm allowed to eat. I've been there. We've got a problem. Yes. Right? We need to stop obsessing and start listening to our body. Yeah. So, okay, we can move on because that's that's scary. It's scary for me to talk about it, Joe. All right, what about this one? This wait, wait, no. This one, we got a special person for this one because this is Chris Bear's favorite musical artist. We need him to sing this I one. I think I'm a clone now. That's There's right. always another me just to hanging around. <laughs> I think I'm a clone now. Is that the song? Yeah, but That's what's the, the real song? What's the I, think I'm alone now. I think I'm alone now. This is not the real song. This is a parody. And so some of us need to check that particular song. Because now we're really hurt I know it. But here's the thing. Is what we're believing for real or is it really a joke? And boy, I'm about, to, I'm about to, to toast up a sacred cow right now because sacred cows are always the most delicious, in my opinion. Okay, so here's a sacred cow that people have. The total carbs versus net carbs thing. Is net carbs for real or is it really a parody? Is it really a joke, okay? And here's the thing. You know why we're talking about this today? Because I don't want the joke to be on you. I don't want companies getting the last laugh on you. Net carbs are a made up thing by companies to sell us products. Now, is there a possibility, and we'll have Dr. Lenskis up in a little while with us, yeah. right? Is there a possibility that there are whole foods that have fiber that your body does not use that fiber as fuel? Absolutely. The, probably the fiber in asparagus. Is that what we're fighting but for? But we're not asparagus talking about fiber, fiber and asparagus. I don't think so. We're talking about soluble corn fiber that you find in keto products. Count total carbs. Yeah. Okay. Even at the end of the day, if your body doesn't use those carbohydrates as fuel because we decided to count them, the worst thing that happens is you ate less carbs than you thought you did. Another possibility of like, is it for real or is it really a joke is it's okay for me to snack all day. This is keto stuff. It's purse bacon. And I'm just going to eat it all day. This is definitely this is definitely a parody that I utilized during COVID, when I didn't have a beginning or ending to my day, and therefore there was no beginning or ending to my snacking. Okay, so it's keto stuff, yes, but snacking is still number one an emotional response. Dr. Sivis, which is like, go talk to that man. It's like a come to Jesus meeting. All right, like he's he made this bald guy cry. All right, he went to an actual doctor's appointment. He was like. Um, but yes, it's but an Dr. emotional Lentz response. Just talked about yeah. this. He talked about insulin, right? Mm -hmm. Every time we eat, we're going to have an insulin reaction. Insulin is not necessarily a bad thing, just so long as we're not having it all day. We're going to ask him about that a little later on. But if all day long, every 20 minutes, we're putting a snack in our mouth, we're having more insulin reactions, as we just heard Dr. Lenska say, we can't lose weight when we have insulin. Yeah. So it becomes a problem. So even if it's bacon, even if it's hard-boiled eggs, 
you're snacking every time you put one nut in your mouth, you're eating a meal. Yeah. Um, I don't have to move, dot, dot, dot. I'm keto. Uh, is, it, 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 is it for real or really a joke? Did we lose weight and me stay on the couch? Absolutely. I, I absolutely lost weight on keto without moving. Is that really how we want to live? No. What is the point of getting a smaller shirt if you're not going to live a bigger life? I thought the whole thing for getting rid of inflammation and being able to be more mobile and uh, my mom not having type 2 diabetes was that we could walk out in confidence and go do stuff together like we went tubing yesterday. I'd never done that before in my life and I could carry my tube and I could walk around and I could be in snow and it was really cool and I could do that because I'm keto and I move. I talk about a lot. We heard Dr. Lenskis talk about this. Only 80% of your health is what you're going to put in your mouth. The other 20% is sleep, stress, and movement. You can have the absolute perfect diet, but if we don't handle sleep, stress, and movement, we're not going to lose weight and possibly gain weight, and I've proven that to myself because I have a pretty good diet. But when you're sleeping three hours a night, which then increases stress, which then also doesn't have sleep, and then because I'm so tired, I can't move, I gain 20 pounds, eating less than 10 carbohydrates a day. Yeah. So it absolutely is important. Last one. <sighs> Everybody say it together. All, All heavy, heavy whipping, whipping cream, cream has carbs. carbs. So this isn't just heavy whipping cream. It's we need to stop trusting the label. Well, it's okay. a Weight Watchers mentality, right? There was zero point food, and if I comprise all of my food from zero eggs point Eggs are food, zero points. Does that mean you can eat 100 eggs a day? And maybe, maybe. It's zero, Joe. It's like it didn't even happen. So, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing about the carbs, okay? We need to remember, if we look at a label, I want you to look at that label and always assume they're lying to you. Why? They probably are. Mm -hmm. Awesome. But here's the thing. Awesome Absolutely. It tells you down to the hundredth of a percent what's in there. Yeah. Not the lies of the nearest gram that the label tells you. That's well, right. Well, you know, here's the thing, though. Some of the companies aren't even intentionally lying, and Chris could probably speak to us. I've spoken to Dave over at Nish about it, too. Do you know legally they must round? They can't not round. They have to round up or down. So... The nutritional labels, when you go buy something, can be off by as much as 20%. So if it says it's 100 calories, it could be 120 calories. Robert Sykes from Keto Brick just put a, a podcast about this because they're trying to get where his label's within 1%. But he's like, that means that he has got to make sure every ingredient that he puts into his product is exact as well. So what we want you to do is always assume up one. So heavy whipping cream, almost every label says zero, but it's actually 4.13 carbs per tablespoon. So if you have an ounce, that's one carb. How many of us actually measure out our heavy whipping cream when we put it in our coffee? I do. G -g 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 and <laughs> if you, let's say you are measuring it out and you're putting one tablespoon and then you go into chronometer and you put, I had a cup of coffee with one tablespoon it still registers at zero, even if at the end of the day you did that six times. The only way it's gonna show you actually had carbs is if you put, I had six tablespoons in one particular Well, soup. I don't wanna face that. So just round up, okay? So if you, and this is a great way that we can keep our love with keto because we're gonna be honest with ourselves. I know we don't wanna be honest, but we need to be honest with ourselves. So if it says one, consider it two. If it says zero, consider it one. And at the end of the day, if you counted it up and you had 20 total carbs, but in reality it was only 10, you're better off. Well, speaking of truth, that brings us to the next song, which is, Girl, You Know It's True. <laughs> Does anybody remember that song from the 80s? Who sang it? Not Billy, Billy Vanilli, <laughs> right? That was the whole point, right? Which I thought was ironic, because if you're going to lie about singing a song, don't put true in it. That's like doubling down on the lie. 
And so today, maybe the the song that needs to be removed from your mixtape with Keto has to do with a lie that you are currently believing as true. And I wanted to start down here, which is my most important favoritist thing ever, and that is talking about mindset. We talk about like, well, mindset doesn't matter. Okay, weirdo. Uh, let's talk about mindset. That's like, you know, flowers and hearts and okay, whatever. But here's the problem. If I truly believe in my mind that north is that way, then if I have to go north, which way am I going? I'm going to go this way. How many times have you read about pilots who ignored their tools, ignored the equipment because they truly believed they were heading in the right direction. And what happened? They hit something. They crashed because what they believed as true, they moved forward with. So if you believe a lie like the only way to deal with a craving is to give into it. If that is your mindset that like, that's what I do, I am helpless. I am not strong, I'm not able to do things, then you will move forward in that believing because as far as you are concerned, that's law and gospel. How about the fact that mistakes should be punished? Ooh. Right, we, we mention this a lot of times on our live streams and on our videos that we go, we slip up, and then what do we do? Oh, wait a second, I had too much food today. It doesn't even have to be too many carbs. I just overate, so what do we do? I'm gonna go on a 48 hour fast. We're punishing ourselves. And then what do we do? We do that in isolation. We're never going to admit, hey, I ate too much, so I'm just gonna not eat or I'm gonna go into the restroom and maybe perch, right? Yeah. We're setting ourselves up for failure and we're gonna end up breaking up with keto because we're gonna be like, this doesn't work. Yeah, how about I'm not having results? That is a lie. That is a lie that you are not having results. I'm having results right now because I'm able to be in a room with people in it. That's results for someone who could not step into, I couldn't go into a bank, I couldn't go into a restaurant. I had to have other people do my grocery sh uh, store shopping because I couldn't be in a room with people. Then I am having progress because I'm in a room with people. All right, now I'm not getting on a scale in front of you, but progress is happening. And what we need to do is, since we've got our paper and pen out and we're making the pros and cons of this relationship, why not widen what we look at as a measurement of success? I'm looking at that boyfriend. I'm trying to think like, should I date him? What are his pros? Well, he has a lot of Pokemon cards and I think that that makes him very dateable, right? Okay. His parents, uh, work at the skating rink, which means I'm going to get into the skating rink for free if I date him, all right? Success, it doesn't matter, like, he doesn't have any hair. Um, I wanna go to the skating rink, so that's a pro for him, I all right? I thought you dated me because I had a Mustang. Obviously. <laughs> so there's other things to look at. Are you looking at, how many over-the-counter medications do you not purchase anymore? If you could say five, how many of you no longer purchase at least five over the counter? I'm talking about, you know, Tylenol. Tylenol. I, you know, a bunch of ibuprofen, Tums, Gasex, Beano, <laughs> Pepto Bismol. Like, I mean, sinus medication. Like all of those things that we don't purchase anymore. That is success that is happening. Yes, we have the scale. Yes, we have different size clothing, and we're working towards that. But there's a lot more success happening. You are having results. Yeah. You know, sometimes even on the scale, not losing is maybe not what you want to see, but not gaining is also something to think about. I recently had a coaching client call me up and they're like, listen, I gained like 40 pounds last summer. And so in September, I decided I'm going back hardcore keto and I started eating all keto food. Yeah, now I was eating a lot more food, but it was keto food. And here it is, and it's February, and I haven't lost any weight. I'm like, okay, did you gain any weight? And she's like, no. And I'm like, that's a win. You won. She's like, no, how did I win? I didn't lose weight. I want to lose weight. And I'm like, yeah, but we have something to work with now because that means you just said you were eating more than you ever ate before, and you got through Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, and you haven't gained one pound. Now we can work with that. 
right? So let's look at the overall picture. One of the things that I love to say to people and really look inward on this one. If you never lost another pound, never lost another pound, no matter wherever you are right now, but you reverse your type 2 diabetes, you don't have heart problems anymore, you have more energy, you have more, less stress, you have someone who is no longer suicidal, would it be worth it? Yeah. And keep talking to yourself until the answer to that question is yes. Yeah. One more song, Joe, and this is a doozy. All for love. How many people love that song, right? I mean, Brian Adams, Rod Stewart, Sting. What movie soundtrack is that song from? Three Musket. That was a great movie. Yeah. Somebody's going home. Somebody's like going on Netflix and they're finding Three Musketeers because that was Disney Plus, Disney Plus has it. Three Musketeers <laughs> on Disney Plus. Right. Not 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 paid for by Disney Plus, but Disney. Hey. <laughs> If they want to sponsor us, I mean, I'm all about guess. obviously. I was even willing to get a picture with you, Mickey, like back when I wasn't taking pictures. Okay, so all for love, Brian Adams, Rod Stewart, and Sting, amazing, amazing singers, and the harmony of them together, it was a beautiful thing, right? It was, it was so melo so beautiful. I remember sitting there with my giant flipping, like it was a tape deck, and it was a radio, and it was a record player. It was boombox. It was a boombox. It was, it was huge. It was actually too big for a shoulder, but it was, it was giant, okay? And I was listening to it and thinking, I think that they should stay together. They can't. Like a band. They can't. Why can't they stay together like a band? They're solo artists. They're solo artists. Maybe somebody out there is, needs to change a song on their mixtape because they're hoping that all the keto doctors and experts will at some point be all on the same page, and I can't move forward until they are all in perfect agreement. It will never, never happen. happen. And never. I'm gonna upset some people. I okay. like to do that. All right. None of them are wrong. None of them are wrong. Whether you have a keto doctor or someone like us saying, you need to eat 85% of your calories from fat, or you have another doctor that says 75% of your calories has to come from protein. Neither one is wrong. They have found things that work for them with clients or patients that they are specifically trying to target. And we're not putting any names out there. There are certain doctors that have specific patients that they are trying to heal, and they found this way works. Rachel and I are very different, if you haven't figured that one out. Mildly. Right? But we're also different in the way we eat. Rachel gets sick if she eats pork ribs. It's a sad thing, because I'm fine with bacon, which I don't understand why pork doesn't like me like that. For me, it's one of my favorite foods. There are people who lose weight eating a stick of butter a day. And then there's other people that they need to eat much higher protein. The only way you're going to know and keep your love affair with keto is to experiment on yourself. Clients call us up and they're like, I want you to be my coach and your job is to tell me exactly what to eat. I can't. I can help you figure out what will work for you. That is my job. My job isn't to tell you what to do. My job is to help you figure out what to do so that when I'm no longer here, you know what to do. Yeah. But that's gonna take some experimentation and it's gonna take us not comparing ourselves to other people and being solo artists. But here's the good point. How many times have you investigated or researched something? Man, can, if I told you like how many video games I've researched and where's like the cheapest GameStop and like how many are in stock, like I've researched a lot of like nonsense things that don't mean anything now. But any research that you do on yourself, it's like you're depositing in your own ATM. And you're going to be able to draw from that for years to come. You're worth getting to know. Maybe that is the biggest lie that, that you need to let go of today is I'm not worth getting to know because I don't like myself for whatever reason. I believed that lie for a long time. But guess what? I believe something new now. I'm worth getting to know. I'm worth the investigation process. And I'm gonna do the hard work and I'm gonna deposit the information in my personal ATM 
And when I need to tweak things, I'll be able to because there'll be individual information for me. We spent the last couple of days hanging out with Dr. Lenskis and we've talked a lot about insulin. And we talked a lot about experimentation he's done on his, himself. And it was interesting, he said, you know, I spent an entire year eating OMAD. I should have had amazing results. But the scale didn't budge. So what did he do? He dug into his pocket and said, well, I also know about this and I know about this. And then all of a sudden he, he talked a little bit about doing some 48 hour fast and the weight started dropping. So it really takes, instead of quitting, going, what else have I gone? What other doctors are out there after I've tried something for a long time that maybe I can not make a drastic change, but just tweak things just a little bit, right? Yeah. If you ever look at like a thermostat, you don't go from one side to the other. I do. Yeah, move it up just a little bit. Yeah. Yep. So. Well, I think that's it. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us tonight. We're so excited to see you. If you haven't, subscribe to our channel. Please subscribe to our channel. Thanks for letting us hang out with you guys.